Hi, Tanisha, how are you? Hello. Oh, I'm behind, but yeah, hello. <laughs> You're a silhouette today, huh? Yeah. <laughs> hello. Hello, Vish, how are you? Good, Jamie, how are you? Good, thank you. Where are you joining us from? Uh, from Austin, Texas. Okay. Yeah, so uh, our company, uh, when we initially started doing um, image recognition based uh, deep learning, um, we followed your course and uh, that was the starting point for us on our deep learning journey. Oh, excellent. So thanks for the course in Austria. Hope it's going okay. Yeah, it's going okay, although I'm not working on deep learning, but uh, it's, it's the go-to resource for new hires. Fantastic. Hello, hello. Hi, how are you? Oh, I can hear you, you can hear me. That's wonderful. Good, good. You sound how about very yourself? surprised. Yes, uh, I thought I had some audio issues there, but uh, seems all is good. How are you doing, Jeremy? I'm okay. I'm making some good progress on getting the, the course ready, um, which oh. has mainly been about getting um, NB process working well. Wonderful. And I'm illustrating it with DALI 2 pictures. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's going to be awesome. <laughs> Do you have access? I just got it. So good timing. Sweet. I still haven't gotten access. I think I signed up like a week later. So that might have been why. So uh, I'm still waiting. <laughs> you know, um, I can try and do a demo if you like. That would be awesome. And this is uh, so wonderful with abstract concepts. I mean, for illustrating uh, uh, articles, uh, you know, I think this is going to have uh, an amazing, um, hmm, well, um, group of people, a very wide group of people group of people who might benefit from it. If I were a journalist and were working on an article, I mean, wow, you know, this is yeah. so much better than going to a uh, stock photo or whatever it's called. I mean, they've got a non-commercial restriction uh -huh. at the moment, but presumably at some point they'll have some kind of paid surface, a service. Um, yeah. This, this oh, look, Molly's like... here. First time, I think Molly's joined us. Hi, Molly. Have you joined us before? Possibly not able to chat. That's all right. Well, hello, anyway. Uh, uh, no, I haven't had a chance to join before. Oh, well, welcome. Have you watched any of the videos? Done any uh, APLing as yet? Uh, I have started the first video. I just saw the, that um, the study group had started uh, yesterday. So yeah. Oh, no worries. <laughs> I'm Catching sure you'll up. be caught up in no time. Uh, this is what it looks like. So who wants me to, yeah, who wants to suggest a prompt? You can always put it in the chat if you like, or just tell me. <laughs> what does the fox say? Wait, you're meant to be giving something to draw a picture of. Is that something you can draw a picture of? Maybe a student uh, working on an assignment using array programming language. A student working on an assignment using an array programming language. Do you want like a photorealistic photo? Do you want a 3D render? Do you want a Pencil drawing, what kind? Huh. Maybe something with colors. So pencil drawing, not so much, but. Uh, we could do a color pencil drawing or oil pastels. You know, 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that sounds great. A color pencil drawing. I don't think Dali seems to um, know when a thing about, uh, oopsie daisy, about array programming from what I've been able to see. Yeah, I don't imagine it should, but <laughs> you know, Generate. maybe it will surprise us. Huh. Some way. Add digital art for striking high quality images. Oh, that's good to know. Mm. It's taking a bit longer than usual for some reason. I know people are going to make movies with Kali and so on. Mm. Like explain every scene to it and it makes a cool movie. Oh, something's happening. Okay, hey, so this is the problem. This. When you, uh -huh. I often find when you kind of like put these extra details, it tries to write things about it, but it doesn't know how to write. So it doesn't really know what array programming is. So it's like written some words that it thinks look a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So well, if we did like a programming well, assignment. pretty well though. Yeah, the, the, you know, fifth and sixth ones, they look somewhat accurate, I would say. That's yeah, this amazing. person's coding by drawing on a screen. Huh. So do you have do you have to pay for this for this no. for get access to Dali? This is free. Anyone can just go in here, is it? Uh, you have to apply, and then you just wait for well months. I think it was. Okay, I might try. All right, well, while we're waiting. Uh, else been happening? Not too much. Right, I added a blog post on my favorite advent of code problem from last year. Uh, and this that one was here? kind of, yeah. Let me, uh, that one was, uh, I don't know, just really, really cool. It kind of worked for APL very, very well. Smoke basin. So this is a map representing the height of the ground at that grid point. So this is the high bits. Okay, that's cool. So for part one, you have to find, what do you do? You have to find the low points or something? Yep, find the low points. Um, add one to the value of each low point and add them up. Oh. oh, that's a good one from Tanishk. Much more creative. A professor who is a cat teaching deep learning in a classroom, photorealistic. Okay. Copy. Let's see how this went. Okay. Huh. It is a pencil drawing. Yeah. Wonder if it would do better at um he told him he told it was programming in hieroglyphics, but knows what hieroglyphics are more than array programming. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and interestingly, when I started watching something about APL on YouTube, it started recommending me videos on you know hieroglyphs and uh, 
I guess, Egypt and stuff. So it can draw the connection. All right, let's open up our one. Think there's anything to pull, but just in case. There is. Yeah. Oh, because of the GitHub pages. Sorry. So I thought we could make a custom operator today. Ooh. The cat is not a professor. No, it's not. <laughs> a professor who is a cat. Hmm. I guess at least it's got glasses on the top left. How one. about like, a maybe cat that makes professor. it a professor? Yes, I mean that could well, but clearly somebody else in the background is doing the teaching. I did an interview this morning with A16Z's uh, newish um, online magazine kind of thing. And we talked about this uh, idea that this kind of prompt engineering is a skill now. It's a skill I definitely don't have yet. The so thing is, like, I feel like it doesn't uh, generalize from one model to another. So you have to like learn from exactly. each model. Exactly. All right. Um, has anybody got a favorite like drawing program for uh, Mac? Um, Have you tried Procreate? I mean, no, not something that fancy, like something just for doing, you know, these kind of things. Yeah. And I also need to find out why my right mouse button doesn't work, because since it doesn't work, I'm now not sure how to insert a page. <laughs> uh, file, no, home. Oh yeah, head page. Um, I'm guessing everybody here is probably uh, familiar with the idea of gradients, but um, it's fine if you're not, because I thought we could just briefly mention it. Um, so if we've got some uh, something like a quadratic, Then the gradient at some point is uh, is the slope at that point. So this would be the gradient at this point is that slope. And you may or may not remember that the slope is equal to the rise over the run which is the change in y over the change in x. So if this is, uh, if this is uh, x2 comma y2, and this is x1 comma y1, then the slope is y to, uh, is rise over run, I said, so it's the wrong way around. 
is uh, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay, and so what you could do is you could pick some point a bit, you know, like, so this is the point we're going to pick, um, and then you could just add a little bit to x, like 0.01x, and this is the point here. So in this case, um, you could actually write y2 uh, uh, and in a different way. So if you've got, so this is like, this is this is some function of x, like x squared, and this is x, right? So you could change um, y2 to instead be function of x plus a little bit, like say 0.01, and y1 would be function of, oops, would be a function of x at the starting point, and then you divide by the amount that you moved x by, which in this case would be 0.01. That'd be another way of doing the change in y over change in x. Does that make sense so far? And so this is like an approximation of the derivative. It's the slope at a point. And I thought we could try and do this uh, in APL. So if we picked a function, I'll show you something interesting. You can do a function a couple of ways. I think we've already learnt <clears throat> that you can do a function like this if you want to do y squared. You can do um, omega squared. That's one way to do it. But um, you could also just do this, right? And that means that um, that just means power of. So you could do something like this. Um, if that makes sense. Um, so then actually what we might do first is a nice operator. So for... it just returns the power operator. Yeah, so this is that... saying that, that f is the power function. And that might not sound very interesting yet, but you could make it a bit more interesting by saying mm -hmm. f is a combination of a function and an operator. And we could give that a more sensible name, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's exactly the same as doing, oops, it's exactly the same as doing that. Okay. Um, so here's an example of something we could do. Let's learn a new operator. which is called bind, which is J. So we can get the help, oh, that didn't work. So we can get the help for it by typing help at Okay, so this thing, this symbol, you'll hear it a lot. It's called jot. And it's an, oh, this is finished. There we go. So a uh, professor who is a cat is too hard, <laughs> but a cat professor is fine. Not sure what happened to it before, <laughs> but clearly professors point at things. This cat professor's just faking it because there's a real <laughs> In fact, <laughs> most of the cat professors, no, not most, some of them are faking it. But yeah, professors point at whiteboards with chalk or sticks, apparently. 
<laughs> it's not obvious it's deep learning, but it certainly looks very mathy. Yeah, it's not good. Well, yeah, that one has like some sort of network or something, it looks like. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> the first one is maybe looking at some activation function. Yeah, oh. could well be. <laughs> uh, okay. So Jot is a dyadic operator. So that means that there won't be a monadic. And it can be a couple of things. It can be beside or bind, depending on whether you pass it functions or arrays. Um, now, uh, for Python programmers, let's call this Python equivalence. Partial. Um, it's the same as using partial in Python. So um, that's a kind of a functional programming idea. And most of the functional programming ideas in the standard library are in the func tools um, module. That's where you can import partial from. And here's what partial does. You define something. And so let's say we could call this power. which does that, three squared. Okay, so what if we wanted to now define squared using power? We could say square equals partial power comma y equals two. And what that says is, um, <clears throat> so partial is a higher order function or an APO operator, i.e. it's something that returns a function. And the function it returns is something that's going to call this function, passing in this parameter. So it's going to always set y in the function to two. So I could then say squared three. Does that make sense? So bind does the same thing. So we could say squared equals um, uh, and we can create a function. So um, we're doing a power of function and we're doing to the power of two. So this is a function. We don't say equals, obviously. And so you can see here, this is this idea that we don't need to use curly brackets and omega and stuff. We can just define a function directly. This is called point-free programming um, in other languages. And it's basically where you write functions without specifically referring to the parameters they're gonna take. Um, and in this case, because this is an operator that therefore returns a function, there's no need for round brackets and whatnot. Does that make sense? No, an operator that returns a function. All operators uh, return a function. That's the definition of an operator in APL. Do you remember last time we did operators, we learned about backslash and slash? Yes, yes. And those are. So it's the B site or bind that's an operator, right? So it's an, it's return it returns a function, okay? So it takes the 
argument on the left and on the right. That's right. And it's returns a function. Operator. So on and the it left, it's going to take a function. function. This is the function to apply. Mm -hmm. And then this is the right-hand side to bind. And it returns a function. And it's an operator, therefore it returns a function. Got it. And you can do it the other way as, as well, which is you could say um, a power of two. And then you could just do the opposite, two to the power of. So this means two to the power of rather than to the power of two. So two to the power of three is eight. So that's the equivalent of, this is the equivalent of partial where I bind the right, the right hand side. This is the equivalent of partial where I bind the left hand side. Wow. Does that make sense? <laughs> it makes sense. It's just surprising how succinct it all is. And mm, it is. it's like Lego bricks. And... It is. Yeah. Um, so let's move some of this stuff into the right spot. Um, okay, so then, um, yeah, let's just go like this. So this one's called bind. And bind's a very common computer science term for this, um, partial function application or bind. In C++, it's called bind. Now, the other thing we could do is we could do um, <clears throat> beside, and beside is what happens if you put, um, if you just pass two functions to it. Um, so for example, we can create a function um, that first does reciprocal. Remember monadic divide is reciprocal. And then it does e to the power of. Remember, star is e to the power of. So this, so if we go, uh, for example, reciprocal of three, and then we do e to the power of that. It's that, and we should find f of three is the same thing. Does that make sense? So this is called function composition. Uh, it's at least it's one form of it. And so first it does this function and then it takes the result and passes it to that function. Um, you can also um, use the function that is returned dyadically. like so, and that is going to be the same as, I think, well, it's not, is it? F two, yeah, it is. It's gonna be two to the power of, a third. So this will be the cube root of two. Yeah. Okay. So it first. So in the case if you do it dyadically, then it first applies this to the right hand side, and then it applies this to the left hand side and the result of that. Um, and they've got some really nice pictures of this somewhere. I wonder if they're here. Oh yeah, bind is also called carrying. Here we are, composition. So there's lots of ways of doing function composition. And so beside, as you can see, it takes y on the right. It passes it through g, which is this function, which was reciprocal. And then f, which was power of, gets the left-hand side and the result of that. Um, which, Interestingly enough, is exactly the same thing as if you 
just put them next to each other, I think. Oh, no, that's different. That's interesting. OK, I'll take that back then. There's something in the it's a uh, API wiki is good for this stuff. Compose. Wait, it says it's the same. That's very confusing. Oh, it's without the parentheses. OK. So that does the same thing. So there's a few ways of doing the same thing here. So it's a bit confusing that, um, I mean, it doesn't need to be, but it can be if you're not careful, that this is a dyadic operator because it takes it had, takes a left-hand side and a right-hand side. It returns a function. The function it returns can either be used monadically or dyadically. Does that make sense? And so the well, way it behaves, is based on um, if it's used monadically, it's reasonably straightforward. We just first apply this, and then we apply that. If it's dyadically, then it behaves like this. It makes sense. It's just interesting that it exists. Like one questions, you know, what what it could be used for. Uh, so the purpose of it is to create. Um, is to is it, the way I think of it is to expand mathematics, right? So in mathematics, we stick symbols next to each other and they have meanings, right? Um, but the rules for what symbols you can stick next to each other and when vary a lot depending on the symbol and stuff like that, you know. Um, so APL tries to just lay out the ground rules and says, this is this is how you can do it. And so let me show you my favorite so far example, um, which is um, calculating um, which is calculating the golden ratio. Um, we're going to need some more operators for this. OK. Um, so we're going to use the next operator we're going to learn is star diuresis. Um, yeah. Which is shift P. And this is also called power, but it's actually the power operator rather than the power function, which is confusing. So you do actually have to be careful. The power function is just a star. OK, it is a. Operator, therefore it returns a function. It's dyadic, therefore it needs a left hand side and a right hand side. Um, so let's define. Um, I don't know if any of you have done meta mathematics, um, but meta mathematics is the philosophical foundations of mathematics. Um, and there's a, a, a small set of theorems that you can use, um, which I think are called the Piano theorem, Piano axioms. Which people used to think you could then derive 
all of math from, although it turns out it's not necessarily true. Um, and so basically the idea is you'd say, okay, we're gonna create something called zero. And then we're gonna create something called equals. And equals is defined by saying for every number x equals x. Um, and that if x, if x equals y, then y equals x. And if x equals y and y equals z, then x equals z. I mean, these are all obviously true things. It's just kind of defining some basic theorems. Um, and then it defines this function called uh, capital S. We just basically say it exists and it returns another number. And basically it defines it in such a way that it's it's the successor of a number. So the successor of zero is one, the successor of one is two, the successor of two is three and so forth. And we actually can easily define S now um, because it's plus one, right? And so if we assume that zero exists and we assume, assume, assume that successor exists, then we can create the number one and we can create the number two, we create the number three, so forth. And um, so at this point, we want to invent addition because in mathematics, you basically are not allowed to assume anything exists except what you put in your premises. So addition is what happens when we apply S a bunch of times. If we want to add three to zero, we would write three S's followed by zero. Does that make sense? So the power function, the power operator simply says how many times to repeat a function. So I want to repeat the function S three times. Oops. So that's the same as writing S space S space S. Okay. So if we want to create a function called add, Um, then we basically are going to apply the S function uh, alpha times to omega. So that's going to start with, that needs to go in curly brackets. So for example, two added to three, we'll start with three and then it will apply S twice. That would be the same as writing S space S space three. Does that make sense? So we just invented addition. Yes, absolutely it does. So we can do the same thing for multiplication. We can apply, multiply. We need to start at one and then we can multiply um, so we're going to multiply by, I'm not sure if it matters which way around this goes. We're going to multiply omega, we're going to multiply by alpha omega times. Oops. Oh, I wrote volt, which obviously is going to break everything. I need to add. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm adding, oh, I'm adding to zero. There we go. So I'm adding to zero. This is what I add each time. And this is how many times I add. So we just invent a bottle play. So um, we can, of course, now invent to the power of. And that would be where we'd start with one and we multiply. Uh, the number of times we multiply will be, um, yeah, the thing on the right. So two to the power of three. Okay. Yeah, um, it is uh, yeah. quite mind bending to look at the syntax though, because, you know, with the, the star thingy, the yeah, star diuresis, star diuresis 
like it, it looked already quite interesting when it was uh, with the uh, monadic s uh, function you know and now it can also so oh, this there on yeah. yeah this this s thing you have uh, in the cell 26 it's just uh, you know on the right hand side of it and uh, uh, it does what it does, but then you can also use it with di dyadic. Uh, you can also use it with dyadic, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> you know, uh, another example of just uh, composing this uh, very small piece of functionality. That Yeah, so it's applying uh, its left upper end function cumulatively g times. And if it's a dyadic function, it's applied repeated. Oh, no, that's not what we want. Uh, if a left argument, here we are. It's bound. So if there's a left argument, it's bound as the left argument. So we've basically um, seen this idea, right, of binding an argument. So that's basically what it's doing. It's, it's saying um, that this is <coughs> multiplied by alpha each time. Um, Okay, now where it gets really fun is that you don't have to put a um, uh, a number on the right. You can put a function on the right. And so this is going to come somewhere towards answering your question, Radek, about what's all this for. So we've now got a sequence of five uh glyphs in a row <laughs> okay so what does that mean well this glyph here we know it means take the reciprocal and then add and there's this is on the left so it's going to be take the reciprocal and add one so let's try it let's just grab that copy We'll call that F, whoops. And so if we go F of one, um, oh, and that, sorry, one F one, I should say, that equals two, right? Because it takes the reciprocal of this and then it applies plus to the result and the thing on the left. So one plus one is two. Uh... Because that's because of this. This is what we get if we do uh, beside. We first apply reciprocal to the right, and then we apply plus to the left and the result. So <clears throat> the reciprocal of one is one, and then the left-hand side is one, and the result of reciprocal is one, and so one plus one is two. And we could take the result of that and pass it back into exactly the same function with the same left-hand side. And we could do that again, take the result of that and pass it into the right-hand side. And if we do this a bunch of times, we actually are doing something quite interesting, which is we're creating something called a continued fraction. And the continued fraction that we're creating is this one. Mm. So we started with one plus one over one, and then we made it one plus one over, so then we made it one plus one over that, and then we made it one plus one over that, and then we made it one plus one over that. Now, if we keep doing that enough times, eventually we're gonna get a number called phi. And phi, is also known as the golden ratio. Um, and the golden ratio, phi, the golden ratio, appears in nature and art basically everywhere. Um, golden ratio. Um, so basically, you know, it appears in nature when we look at kind of the proportions of things. It appears as the ratios in famous paintings. It appears on the snail's shell. 
um, it's this uh, it's this number that appears everywhere. Um, and why are we talking about it? Well, we can calculate it by typing this again and again and again. But that's going to get pretty boring. Um, we could do this, right? So that's going to do one over, sorry, one plus one over one. And then it's going to do one over that. And then it's going to do one over that. And it's going to do one over that. It's going to do one over that. Um, and I think we now know that we could replace that with just do f a bunch of times. I don't know, five times. So that's nice because now we can like go a bit further and get. That's actually a pretty good estimate of the golden ratio. There you go. Yep, about one one to one point six one eight. Does that make sense so far? Yes. All right. But how do we know how far to go? Well, basically, we want to keep on applying f until the next time we apply f, the result doesn't change to within floating point error. Mm -hmm. If you replace 15 with equals, then the power operator, if you put this on the right hand side, repeats this function again and again and again. And each time it passes to this function, the previous result and the current result. And it stops if this function returns one. Oh. And in math, we call that the fixed point. The fixed point of a function is the point at which, or of a sequence, I guess, is the point at which it stops changing. So there's exactly the same thing but iterated exactly the random amount of times. I'm not sure how to change the, pre the precision that we print out things here, but if you printed this out in high precision and then passed it to itself again, it wouldn't change. Oh. And so if you replace F with its definition, which is this, then you get that. And so oh. the answer to your question of like, what's all this for, is so that we can write short, concise mathematical expressions for things like, here's the fixed point of the continued fraction that calculates phi. Is that kind of mind blowing? It is, <laughs> very much so. Ah. But it's, it's, it's amazing, you know? It is amazing. Um, and, you know, yeah, there's something delightful, I think, at least to me, about, um, you know, like, yeah, realizing notation can take you this far. Um, and that, like, uh, you know, I would much rather write this than, um, than this, you know. And this doesn't even, you can't even put this in a computer because what the hell does dot, dot, dot mean? That means like, yes. oh, a human ought to be able to guess what goes here. Um, so um, yeah, I think it's beautiful. It's a beautiful notation. It's a powerful notation. And it lets us express concept complex things fairly simply, like once, once we get the idea. And the nice thing is then like, because we were able to express this quite simply, then we can use that as a thing that we then like create another layer of abstraction on top of that. We use that as an input to something else. You know, so it's because that, you know, if we didn't have this kind of bind composition, sorry, this uh, beside composition idea, then this whole thing wouldn't really have worked, you know. Um, we can use these ideas in um, Python as well. Um, in Python, you can do function composition um and i think last call might have something if i remember correctly i can't quite remember what's where you partials that could give yeah compose so 
<clears throat> this is the same as the side in APL. Um, so you can pass it a list of functions. So for example, here's one function and here's another function. And then here we are composing the two together. It goes in the opposite order, I think. So it applies F1 first and then F2, if I remember correctly. Sorry, what were you saying? Oh, no, I was, uh, I was going to point you to the compose function, but you found it before I, I said anything. So. Yeah, no worries. Um, and there's a bunch of things like this in fast course. So for example, I really like partial. So I created the better version of partial, which doesn't throw away documentation, for instance. Um, this is basically the same as kind of broadcasting. Here we are, I've got created my own bind class. Um, now I created all these before I did much with APL because they're used in other functional programming languages. Um, possibly, possibly, or maybe even probably APL did them first, I'm not sure. Um, there's a, um, there's actually a whole uh, uh, academic world called combinatory logic, which is all about, there you go, eliminate the need for variables. It's kind of like point-free programming. And um, the ideas that are in APL, uh, I wouldn't say they come from combinatory logic because nobody knows if Ken Iverson had ever seen it, this stuff before. It's quite possible he reinvented all this from scratch. But it turns out <clears throat> they're all exactly the same. And um, something that Connor in the uh, Arraycast podcast mentioned, which I has just arrived, is that there's a book of puzzles which actually cover lots of the combinatory logic um, ideas. So. I will let you know once I start going through it, what I think. Awesome. So there's a lot of like layers of the onion we can peel off, you know, and it turns out that we kind of find ourselves in all these different areas of math and logic and philosophy and whatever. Jeremy, if you uh, check that book out, you have to let me know how it goes. I, I checked it out before, maybe a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, Stephen Wolf from you know, Mathematica was talking about combinators, maybe it was only a year ago. And I happened to get interested and I checked the book out and I, I kind of worked through some, but I got lost pretty quickly. I'm sure that you will probably fare much better than me. Oh, I so don't know about that. I'm not, see, how, I'm not see how it goes. Mm. Well, you know, maybe at some point we can start working through it together if people get interested. Um, yeah, it's interesting listening to like an uh, earlier Raycast episode where Connor talked about how he went to some, uh, he just started with APO and he went to some APO user group meeting or something and like said to people like, wait, trains are they combinators and combinators are trains and everybody at the APL user group meeting he said all said like no this is a new APO invention it's not some other thing because nobody you know like well intellectual worlds don't mesh very much and nobody realized uh, particularly the APL intellectual world I've noticed it's pretty pretty cloistered to be honest <laughs> um, so anyway yeah they are <clears throat> they are the same thing uh, so I'm trying to remember why the hell we were doing all this. Um, this is definitely our most intense study session, right? <laughs> uh, and please don't be worried if this feels a bit intimidating because it is, and that's fine. And this, we're meant to be learning new 
interesting parts of the world and when we find them we shouldn't expect them to make sense straight away uh, so we were doing that's right we were doing jot yeah no i mean that's probably it um that's a good place to finish isn't it um just trying to remember then we were doing Yeah, that's fine. I don't think we need any of this. Oh, that's right. We're going to do custom operators. Okay, I think we've got some good background to tackle that. Oh, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we got to here. Um, I guess before we go, we should at least write down something so that we've made some start here. So, um, oh, yeah, okay, I remember now. Um, I wanted to point out then, yeah, okay, so we just we were going to use I was going to do squared, that's right. So I wanted my function to be squared. And so to do that, uh, I had to show you that this means squared. Okay. Um, so then to calculate uh, the derivative of this function at set, at some point, we're going to use um, this formula that we wrote down, this one here. So it's going to be f of, um, let's create some number to hold our 0.01. So the difference we're going to work on is going to be 0.01. So it's going to be the function f, f of, and so let's calculate this at some point, say two. No, let's do three. Okay, so we're going to calculate it at x equals 3. So we're going to go function of x plus d, okay, uh, minus um, function of x, okay, and then that's going to have, we'll have to go in parentheses. Okay, and then we're going to divide that by 0 0.01. There are better ways to write this in APL, but I want to make it like somewhat familiar. Okay, and for those of you who remember calculus, the actual derivative of x squared is 2x, so the correct answer would have been 6, so which is, you know, we're on the right track. Um, if we uh, set t to a smaller number, we would get a more precise answer. Um, yeah, so where we're going to try and head to is that we can actually create our own operator that will calculate the derivative of a function at a point. And so maybe that's what we'll try to do next time. Uh, any comments or questions before we go? It's really cool. <laughs> awesome. I'm glad you. Yeah, so it's great way. again. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye, all. Thank you for showing yeah. us yeah. all this. Yeah. Bye -bye. Good one. Bye. Bye. Thank you.